Well, good evening. Welcome to uh, session 12 of Helping Hurting People. Uh, this evening, as Vince very kindly and lovingly did, the uh, sharing from the Bible about drunkenness and um, uh, that need for something outside ourselves, that intense lust that we have for something that is a sinful lust. And uh, what I hope to do this evening is, is uh, my part in this is going to be to help you talk with people about these particular things. Um, someone who is active in their addiction generally needs some kind of professional help, AA, NA, something else. They really need to have a, someone come alongside them that really understands this particular thing and are really capable and able to help them. Now, part of your job could be to assist them in getting you know, to something, but to really spend uh, uh, time trying to counsel or uh, do that with people who are addicts or uh, are active in their addictions, it's probably best to get them enter, enter into the, the system that's already there to help them. Without God and, without, and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, without a desire for the scriptures and a passion for a love relationship with God and his son, there is no true healing from any addictive behavior. I think we've already heard that this evening. Tonight, we're going to look at the addictive behaviors. Um, many times we just leap to thinking that it's going to be uh, alcohol and drugs, but as Vince alluded to, there's a lot of other kinds of addictions. It can be gambling, pornography. It could be food. It could be shopping. It could be, there's a lot of things that we do that are, by an addictive behavior, it's one that we just, we go to God at night and we pray. We say, God, please help me. Please help me in the morning. Please help me not do this today. Please. And then the next thing you know, 15 minutes later, an hour later, by the evening, whatever, we're saying, God, please help me. I need, oh, please help me again. And we get sick and tired of being sick and tired of doing the same thing over and over and over again. So, again, without God and without the Holy Spirit guiding and directing us, it is really very, very difficult, if not impossible, to really overcome these things. Uh, to be able to help ourselves and to help others, we need to persevere in applying the scriptures more deeply in our own lives and in our role as a helper. Because when you come alongside people who are struggling, if you're not grounded, if you're not really settled in the scriptures, if you don't have your own self pretty clear, I mean, you don't have to be perfect, uh, I'm not perfect. Oh, well. Anyway, to have yourself be grounded in the scriptures and knowing then that you are listening to God and he is then helping you to say the words that need to be said and take the actions that need to be taken. The main part of being a good listener is to show others how the gospel message, which is uh, growing in Christ too, meets our deepest needs. We never cure sin. We contain it. We can be delivered from the lust, which consists of thinking and passion for something sinful, and healed of the physical damages of the sin. But the biggest consequence is we will always have to be on the alert, being very vigilant to keep ourselves away from any temptations. We can never let down our guard. If you talk with someone who has been in, uh, an, let's say, an alcoholic for 20 years or more, this is something that you're going to hear from that person that's been clean and sober. What they're going to say is that person continues to go to meetings, chooses carefully where to hang out, selects friends with wisdom, is diligent to watch for stressors and negative thought patterns, continually works on reading scripture and have prayer and service to God. Whether it's alcohol or anxiety, drugs or depression, we can be more than a conqueror. Christ took care of the problem of sin. Now we have to be obedient and not sin anymore. This sounds simple. And until Christ returns, we're going to have struggles and traumas and temptations. But one of the things that we need to also look at tonight is that for every alcoholic, drug addict, or any other kind of addicted person, there's a person or someone around them that helps sponsor them in their addiction. That's a codependent. That's the term that people use, a codependent. I'm very much a family systems person. Family systems, I think it's so important because 
<clears throat> let's say we're working with uh, a, a, a team, we're working with a team, and he's getting better, and, and we're working with him, and things are fine, and, and this person's getting stronger, stronger in the word, and then you put him back into the dysfunctional system he came out of, and really doesn't have much of a chance. He's got to be in a system that has been worked on so that the dysfunction now isn't there and that they then can support the changes and, and really, you know, uh, say, great, this is wonderful that you're changing. But what happens many times is that when someone who is in recovery or, or recovering from whatever it is tries to make these changes, the people who are closest to that person don't like the change. Why? Because one of the things is they still see the person through the filter. Oh, well, I can't trust her. I can't trust him. I can't this. I can't that. And so we look, you're looked at. The person is looked at through this filter. And then the other thing that happens is that the, the family or close friends don't know how to act now. I know how to control you. I know how to make things nice here. We'll talk about this in a minute, how pe different ways that people, you know, make the, the addiction okay. You know, I know how to control it. Oh, but you're changing and, and you're doing kind of some things that are worthwhile here and, and you're not drinking or you're not drugging or you're not doing pornography. I just don't know how to handle it. And, and, and it really causes trouble. So it's very important that we look at sometimes with family systems. And this is kind of in my mind where I'm thinking you have a big role in something you can really help. It's the people possibly that aren't the identified client, which would be the uh, one who's the addict, but those who help perpetuate this addiction. Well, who would do that? Well, let me explain something. Nancy Reagan in the 1980s and 90s did a, did, was really big on the war on drugs. And <clears throat> The government at that time allotted just tons of money for drug research. And what they did was the, the drug research. And what they did was that they had all kinds of research being done out in California. And some of this research, what they found was that there is, there is in this family system, there's this codependent enabler that helps the alcoholic or helps the um, uh, person who's, who's the addict to be that way. Family, a family adapts to the chemically dependent person by taking on roles that help reduce stress, deal with the uncertainty, and allow the family to function within the dysfunction and fear created by the alcoholic. We learn these roles as children in a family who struggles with addictive behaviors. Any type of abuse, neglect, or by modeling by parents or caregivers. You don't, I am a recovering codependent. I figured this out when I was in my early 40s. Now, I did not have any addictions in my family at all, but my mother was a poster child for codependency. And she learned it. Her father had been an alcoholic. And she learned it from him, which then just passed on down because I saw it modeled. These roles appear to help reduce stress and deal with uncertainty. Even though these roles may seem to reduce stress at the time, they do not reduce anxiety. These behaviors allow the alcoholic or addict to continue in his or her behavior. In order to survive, for the family to survive, the family develops ways of managing the chaos. There's going to be elephants in the room that they ignore. There's going to be pain and suffering that they ignore. These roles are prominently seen. Um, <clears throat> members of family, family members may take on different roles at different times, and they may switch roles frequently. It is important to know what characteristics promote unhealthy relationships so that we can help those in denial or wanting to change to look at the word to make a change. So the first one I have listed there is the enabler. The enabler is the one really who keeps the alcoholic or the addict an alcoholic or an addict. The enabler is a family member who steps in and protects the alcoholic or addict from the consequences of his or her behavior. There are different motivations to do this behavior. One is maybe to protect, another one is to prevent embarrassment, another one is to avoid conflict, want to clean up the messes, 
and they minimize the, the, um, the results and the chaos of the addiction in the family. Now, the enabler and, uh, is, you see this a lot of times, and I'm going to pick on mothers here. A mom will, a five-year-old, goes outside without his shoes and socks on, and it's 30 degrees below zero. So, you know, oh, you've got to have your boots and your shoes and socks on. Oh, you've got to have that. So the mother goes running out, gives the kid some socks and shoes, chases the kid down. Okay, no, you can't do that. You got to, okay, five years old, you might say, mm, okay. The kid's eight years old. He goes to school, forgot his lunchbox. He doesn't have his homework papers. Mom, I don't have my, okay, I'll leave work. I'll go home, I'll get that, and I'll come over here and I'll fix this for you. And then they get to be 12 or 13. Oh, you know, the kid whines about something and the parent goes right ahead and just does something that the child neglected to do for him or herself, didn't take responsibility for him or herself, and the parent is taking over that responsibility and going, oh, here, oh, here, I'll make this all nice for you. This will be just wonderful. Let me just help you. Let me just overdo. And so the enabler really is one who robs a person of becoming independent of being a mature person. The hero is the one that attempts to perform well. I get A's in all my classes. I do everything just right. Look at me, I'm fine. I come from all this over here, but I'm really very, very good. That's the hero. The scapegoat is one who creates problems in order to deflect attention away from the real issue of the alcoholic or addict or whatever the addiction is. Generally, this is done by rebellion, failing in school, you know, doing substance abuse on their own, sexually acting out. And this role generally works well in becoming the focus of the family's attention and overlooking the real problem. This is the identified client, they think, but it isn't. <clears throat> the lost child is the one that really, this is really sad, the lost child. I find so many people in counseling who, who really are lost. They just kind of fall into the woodwork. They're back in a corner by themselves. They don't, know really, they don't really know how to relate to people. They isolate. They stay by themselves. It's just easier, and I don't want relationships because it's too hard. Then you have the mascot who uses humor as a means to escape. Do you ever have those kids in your class always cracking jokes, the one in the back that's always ha ha and whatnot, or you know, playing practical jokes and stuff. That's, the, that's one of the ways that uh, they mask the pain that they feel and the deprivation that they feel. One of the things that it, uh, someone who has an addiction does is the addiction becomes the relationship. It's not the wife, it's not the kids, it's not the husband, it's the, the whatever it is you, you're thinking about how it is, that person is thinking about how it is they're going to get it, where they're going to get it, how they're going to get this fix that they need to feel good. And so people who are in relationship with them or want to be feel left out, don't feel loved and cared for because of that. When an, while an addict is forsaking all else to take in a substance or whatever, he, she will die or hit their bottom unless someone else is taking care of the things needed to actually survive, such as food, shelter, finances, and relationships. This many times is one of the things where people will um, people will uh, they say that, that they say that an alcoholic or drug addict has to hit bottom. They just have to hit bottom. Sometimes I wonder what the heck the bottom is because I would have been flat out on the you know just gasping for air at what some of the things are that they just put up with. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, where is this bottom? Don't know. But it is important to understand that there is the one in its enter the codependent. For the alcoholic or addict, the solution to his or her problems is the drug of choice. For the codependent, some of the solutions to his or her problems are overstepping boundaries under the guise of helping. That's, you know, taking the lunch and the Jim closed to school, coming to the rescue to, of someone. Oh, I'll call work and tell them that you can't come in. Doing God's work, helping the family stay together. 
The unhappy truth about the codependent behavior is that as benevolent as it can look, it serves the giver more than the receiver. And that's hard for us little recovering codependents to hear because we think we're just wonderful givers. Oh boy, I'm just over here and I'm just helping you out and I'm doing all this for you. But really, it's the attention that I, that I would get from others saying, oh, you're doing well. Oh, and I'm feeling needed and I'm feeling wanted and I'm like I can do something to help somebody. You know, that can be fine. There's, a, there's a, that middle ground, 40 to 60 bell curve, you know, the middle area there, 40 to 60, that's a healthy area. Yes, I am healthy. Yes, it is good. If it's godly and done well according to the word, but if I'm doing it out of the need to feel good, need to make this person feel better so I could feel better, then that is really sin. So a safe place for the addict is, you know, whatever the addiction is, that's the safe place for them. That's where they feel okay. Even though I hate it, even though I despise it, even though I know it's causing chaos around me, this is where I feel good. The neediness and approval of others is a safe place for codependence. One who has addictions need need to be one who has addictions need to be treated by professionals. Most of what you can do as a helper is to work with a person in the family who needs support. Looking out for the role the person takes in the family is important to assist that person to not be in denial of the role and to go to the word for support and assistance. Codependents look good. And they really try hard to look good because, you know, that's what I do. I, 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 I martyr myself for this addiction. I martyr myself for, you know, what it is that's going on in my family. I'll just, I persevere. <sighs> uh, you know, it's just as much of a sin as any other addiction. It really can become an addiction to us to have to be that way in our relationships. And for codependents, you know, an alcoholic, you know, when you wake it, you know, when you're there and you've got bottles like this all around, or the drug paraphernalia is all over, or the, all the computers immediately go to porn sites and stuff, it's hard to say I I don't do, I don't do that. But what codependent, it's hard for that person to say, yeah, that's what I do, that's what I am doing, because they're convinced that what they're doing is right and that I am helping. How can we help people who battle with repeated patterns of addiction? One is we talked about, uh, Vince talked about earlier, certainly acknowledge the sin and don't be in denial. Be specific about what it is that you're doing. Pray daily for forgiveness of sins because sometimes we get so bogged down, oh my gosh, I did this, I can't believe I did that again. And then hating and loathing self, that's wrong. That's sin in itself. We have to go to God, allow us to to grieve the loss, to forgive, and to forgive ourselves, allow God to forgive us. Have genuine godly sadness and grieving for our sins. Godly sorrow brings us to repentance. It is important to grieve, but we can't just say, oh, well, you know, it's a disease. I can't help anything about it. Or, oh, well, my father did this all the time, so why shouldn't I? Or, oh, my mother was, no, 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 no. 1 Corinthians 7 gives us a great list for helping people in a systematic way to deal with sin patterns. And this, uh, Vince covers this in his uh, book, Sober and Alert. Um, <clears throat> it says in the ESV, foresee what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. We first of all have to acknowledge, what this is telling us is we first of all have to acknowledge that we need God and believe on Jesus Christ, God's Son. We need to admit that without him we live in darkness and the only way to light is through Jesus the Messiah. We have to pay attention to what we are thinking and doing, guarding our minds, being ready to really think about what we're thinking. Do you think about what you're thinking? Can you help someone else to think about what they're thinking? What, I, what it is, it's like, I, I use this uh, idea that it's, your mind is like this box. And there's a door on this box like this, a little trap door. And I, I, I'm very simplistic, and as you all know. But I think Jerry's not here. And then I have, I have this little uh, uh, man at the door. 
I like a man. I like the soldier. He's just, he's there. It, he guards the word. He's 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 the word. He represents the word. Okay, so a thought tries to come in. Marianne, you're an idiot. You're stupid. And you can't remember things. Doctor Mozo looks at it and he goes, "Huh? What?" He takes his sword and he smacks it. Get out! And so the trap door goes like this, and it doesn't go in my mind. All right. So another thought comes in. Gee, God really loves you. Look what He did for you today. Blah blah blah. Come in. Oh yes, this is great. Trap door opens. In goes the thought. I think about the thought. <laughs> Every thought needs to be under the obedience of Christ. It's like Christ at that door. He's the one to search. The word is sharper than any two-edged sword. What we put in our minds, we have to see that it's pristine. We have to see that it's holy and good what's in our minds. When our minds work like that, they're getting healed. God heals them. They change our neural pathways so that we can think the way we want to think. And it's just wonderful, the healing that it does for our bodies. The hormones that are just coursing through our system are healing, healing us. The Holy Spirit heals us. And so when our, it's all managed by our thoughts, I'm going to have that extra piece of cake because it tasted good, and why not? Just celebrate. Get out. Go. Okay. But if I put it in my mind and I dwell on it, I go, hmm, that cake really is good. I really shouldn't have some. But I really like that cake, and that's chocolate cake, and I love chocolate. If I start that, that's how sin conceives itself, and then I act on it. A couple of times recently, I've noticed this last week, there were two or three things that came in my mind. I mean, I'm like, what the heck? Where did that thought, what, what? And I just went, no. And the sword came out, smashed it, and I stopped thinking about it immediately. I didn't even entertain that I had entertained that thought. That's what we have to do. Now, do I do that all the time? No, unfortunately. But enough so that it, it really is helpful. So I hope that helps you kind of figure out the thoughts. We want the thoughts of God. And we have to discern, is that thought according to what the word says? Way back many years, many years ago, we were at a big conference way out in Ohio. I don't know, there were thousands of people there that I thought I'm thinking of the right conference. Anyway, Dr. Wirrell stood up and he said, would you like to have your thoughts on the TV monitors up here? And we all go, ooh, 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 <laughs> you know? But that's, that's how, do you want your thoughts to be on a monitor? Would you like to see him up here on Sunday morning? Oh. <laughs> you know? Gee, how come she's wearing that outfit again? You know, <laughs> whatever it is, you know? I got up early for this. You know, somebody's off key in the music, you know? No, we have to keep every thought under the obedience of Christ. All right. So uh, then take responsibility for the sin patterns that you do. We can't make excuses. There's no reason why I'm standing at the refrigerator. I can't blame Bill because I'm standing in front of that refrigerator looking for something to eat. I can't blame anybody but me. I'm the one that does that. Grieve your sinful thoughts and behavior in a godly way. Flagellating yourself over and over and over. That's beating yourself like this, you know, with a big whip thing. <laughs> Doesn't help. And if it's appropriate, make restitution for our behaviors. A uh, person with good boundaries is not a codependent. Boundaries is a wonderful um, system that has been uh, written about for quite a while now. In this book by Cloud and Townsend, if you have any question about boundaries, I highly recommend you read this book. It's just too much of a whole thing for me to get into right now because we just don't have the time. But this is excellent. It's an excellent book to give to people. But it helps, helps you to figure out what is mine and what is yours? What is it of this that I need to work on? And what is it that I need somebody else to work on? This is his part of it. This is my part of it. This is what I can affect. This is what I can make some difference in. This person has to do that. I can't reach over here and get into that person's stuff. And nobody can, I shouldn't let people come in and take and do for me or take and do my stuff and let them do it. We have to be independent. We're in, independent. 
but we're interdependent. All right. Um, you know, these are some questions here. Um, do we know how to set limits and still be a loving person? Codependent has a really hard time with that. How do I set limits and yet be a loving person? How am I loving to this person by telling them, no? Sarah taught me that today. No. This is no. <laughs> this is no. And this is kind of a soft no, right? Well, no. Being able to use that word and yet feel that you're being loving, that you're being kind, and that you're standing up for yourself as well as helping the other person to mature and be a, an individual that is um, mature too. Do I feel like I can, um, oh wait a minute, do I feel like I have to do what the other person wants even though it is detrimental to me? How many of you have ever changed, well let me own this, I have majorly changed plans. I have reordered my life and changed something really wanted to do, really important, so that I could accommodate someone else. And I go to accommodate that other person, and the person, I go to the door and I say, hi, I'm here, you know, blah, 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 blah. Oh, no, I'm not, I, I'm not doing that. See ya, bye. You know, that is the kind of behavior that is not good boundaries. I was overstepping mine, and then I wasn't being careful of what I needed. And it is important to care about what you need because that's between you and God. You've got to have this piece going well too. Um, the other one, uh, do I feel like I have to do what the other person wants even though it's detrimental to me? Teenagers deal with this a lot. You know, oh, everybody else is smoking dope. They really should too. Or, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, they don't sound like that, I'm sorry. Um, do I feel like I can actually tell someone or others that I have a need and expect to be heard and understood? This is a big piece to be, having good boundaries, is being able to tell someone I have a need. You, in your work and helping other people, you can help them in a safe place to say, I have a need. This is something I really want. And you listen with your excellent listening skills and you reflect back to them and you acknowledge that they have this need. Oh, and then let's rush out and fix that need. Let's go fix it, let's go, no. You listen to what the need is and then you help the person to figure out how that person's need is going to get fixed. How that person is going to do it. You don't do it for them. Um, <clears throat> First John 1, 9 talks about if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Out of love for God, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we learn to suppress our own lusts and passions and instead have the mind of Christ, thinking his thoughts and doing his works. Um, but I would like to look at a little further down where it talks about these things that are bolded here, self-reflection, being willing to change, doing the hard work, read scripture and ask God for wisdom about yourself, be aware of symptoms of abuse, depression, grief, and other signs of woundedness in those you meet. Demystify the person's perceptions. What I mean by that is, you know, somebody will say, oh, you know, I, I, I'm just alone and, and I'm probably crazy. You think I'm crazy. Well, no, you're not crazy. You have a lot of things going on. There's this, this kind, I get this a lot. People say, oh, I don't want to tell you you think I'm crazy. No, you know, this person died, that person died, somebody else died in the last, you know, six months. This has happened, this has happened. No, that your thoughts are mixed up and that you're just not really on top of things right now is, is, is okay. I mean, that's how it is. But how are we going to get out of this? You know, let them talk for a little bit. We don't want to go to the, the solutions too early. But let them make sure you've heard them. And then moving into, okay, so what, can, what, can, what are some thoughts you have about how we can do this? Uh, but demystifying the perceptions. Uh, give permission to be honest. That's so important. Don't give the simplistic answers that we talked about before. Not just these little theological euphemisms like, oh, you know, just, just believe God. Everything will be okay. That's true. But is it really that everything's going to be okay? 
because life has some hurt to it. Life has pain. We have to be able to go through it. But with God, we can get through it, whatever it is on the outside. Uh, look for opportunities to communicate the message of redemption. This is in, in the kingdom coming and the gospel and believing on Christ. We're going to talk a lot more about that next week. Um, and help people practice the spiritual disciplines. We've talked about those a lot. Um, the prayer, scripture reading, and so on. We'll again, we'll talk more about that. Provide resources that are available. Maybe they need agencies in the community. Maybe they need a counselor. Maybe they need to get to their minister at church. Maybe they need to get hooked into some fun things at the church. Um, it, it's important to get them connected with others. Hurting people need to see and feel our love. And sometimes they need to be encouraged to take steps of faith to carve out a new way to live. And this is where I really see you making such a great impact. You really can in people's lives. D.H. Lawrence, and I'm not really sure who he is, the world fears a new experience more than it fears anything because a new experience the place displaces so many old experiences. We don't like change. We don't want to change because we know, you know, it's like the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. Well, we need to change. The word says to change. It encourages to change. And even at my tender young age, I change. I have to change. If I don't change, I'm going to stagnate and get back to my old ways. We have to, we have to keep changing. Um, the big thing is don't function, don't, don't focus on their pain all the time. Dealing with wounds is, can be all-consuming for the victim and the helper. Uh, carve out time to do fun things together, help them laugh, spend time with others, and find joy in life. Hence this big book here. I brought this book just to show you. Back in 2002 and before that, a man named Martin Sel Seligman, who was president of the uh, uh, American Psychiatric Association, <laughs> American Psychiatric Association, and he said, look, we study in psychology so much of what is negative, the anger, the hurt, the, you know, all this other stuff. We, we focus on all the negativity and do research on it, but what, why don't we look at people who are healthy? Why don't we look at people who are successful in life and see what, and let's research them and see what their characteristics are like. Well, from that research came this, and there's plenty more since then. But some of the topics that they have in here of research, and I'll read a few of them to you so you'll believe me. Um, all right, it's right here. No, it isn't, it's right here. No, it isn't, it's right here. Where is it? Where you lose a sticky note, all right. Um, for instance, some of these chapters are on, and you're going to hear some of the pop psychology stuff now uh, when I say some of these. Happiness and life satisfaction, resilience, concept of flow, positive emotions, um, uh, creativity, well-being, mindfulness. You hear that? That's the big buzzword now. It's a cottage industry. Um, optimism, hope theory, self-efficacy. Setting goals for life and happiness. Um, uh, authenticity, uniqueness seeking, humility, compassion, gratitude, love, empathy and altruism, um, toughness, uh, so on and so forth. So you get the idea. These were things that people who were healthy, this is what they did. They were happier, they were healthier, they were a, a lot of these things. All these things, actually. And so, so what? So we know this. What they bumped into with all this research is God. People who were healthier, happier, more altruistic, and so on, were people who loved God. They were more, they, they break it down to spiritual, spirituality and religiousness. People who were healthier were more spiritual and religious. And actually, the more spiritual part than the uh, actual religious part, which they counted as, you know, saying, saying prayers every day, doing a rosary, doing this kind of stuff, that, that was what they called religion. The spirituality piece was even higher. So, and some of you know that my dissertation was done on thankfulness and gratitude. And that thankfulness and gratitude um, piece, they said that people who were more grateful were more pro-social, healthier, 
I mean, there's a whole list of what, what happened. And they found that they also were more, uh, more spiritual people. So what I did my dissertation on was, let's see where I wrote it down because I forgot the name of it, the functions of God, minded gratitude versus interpersonal gratitude in spiritual and psychological systems. And I did a multiple regression study, which was valid, and it was reliable. It was really a good study. Thank God for my committee. Um, and the, one of my ending statements here, in it, I said, this study was an initial investigation concerning God as benefactor. What I tried to do was parse out people who were thankful to God and people who were just thankful. You know, I'm just thankful that I got through the day. But having intentionality towards God. Those who chose to have God as benefactor were more altruistic mind, altruistically minded, had higher levels of elevated feelings in response to moral beauty, and felt gratitude from a close union with God in prayer. Another way of feeling gratitude was due to positive outlook, personality traits, and sensing a connection with humanity. Even though a new construct was examined, which is God is a variable, this study made a con contribution to pastoral counseling by investigating whether belief in God as a benefactor does make a difference in people's psychological lives. There remains empirical work to replicate this study, and despite the limitations of this study, the examination of God-minded gratitude found that having God as benefactor augmented gratitude. It is so vital that in whatever it is that ails us, whatever it is, we have to have God. We, that has to be our focus, bringing people to that. It takes time. We just can't sometimes if people get, you know, well, let me jam this down their throat. You have to walk by the spirit with it. And you, know, you have armed, your toolbox is armed. You've got some good questions. You've got some good stuff here going on. You've kind of got a feel for things, how it's supposed to go. You worked it, you've worked in your groups. You've had these talking times and stuff. Hopefully you're practicing this one during the week with people. Um, again, you're the front lines. This is where the rubber hits the road. It's in the conversation. It's the coming alongside. Somebody on Sunday, they're looking kind of over here. You go alongside them and you see what's going on with them. Well, what's going on? How are things going? You start the conversation and that makes connection. And then you make that connection and then you can hear what's going on. You hear what's going on and then you can listen. They feel heard. So you, they feel heard, they trust you. They trust you, then you start right in with whatever the word says about whatever the issues are that are going on. It's really a good way to do it. Okay, so that's all for this. And what I'd like to do for the community activity, I was thinking for a little bit and I forgot to say anything to uh, Terry, but I was wondering if you'd like to come up and uh, be, my, be a codependent so we can work with a codependent this evening. I thought you might enjoy that. Oh, while she's coming up here, I would like to um, recommend this book, Codependent No More by Melody Beatty. It is the primer of all codependent books. It is the one that you would want to read or to have someone else read. And the book that I love, and you can see I have earmarked this on many occasions, it's called The Language of Letting Go. It's kind of a daily thing, but if it's by Melody Beatty also, it, it is absolutely excellent. And then, of course, the Boundaries book. And one of the books that we use a lot here around the church is this 12-step spiritual journey book. This is a really phenomenal book. In my 40s, this really helped. This and The Heart of Christian Living changed my life. These two things. So, okay. All right, so you have to come over a little close to me so right. we can talk. We're a little closer than what you'd probably want to be, but that's all right. So uh, what I would like to do is I'm going to ask you again, remember how we did a couple weeks ago, for you guys to offer up what you think should be said at that time and what we can do and how to keep the conversation going. So how are things going with you with... Uh, what do you want to talk about? Okay. Sure. Oh, okay. All right. So, 
Um, how are things going with uh, hubby? So you well, can be the codependent now. Okay. Well, he's he does keep drinking, but we're managing. You know, um, we're. We're managing now, you know, so he's drinking less and less, and we're kind of holding things together, you know, more. So mm -hmm. I, I've learned how to deal with them. Mm -hmm. And how, how is it that you're dealing with them? Well, I just avoid confrontation with them, you know, at any cost. You know, I try to keep the peace. Okay, well, what would you say? What would be something that you might say at this point? Reflective listening and an open question. Yeah, how does that work for you? No, <laughs> not well. <laughs> so okay, I'm going to say, well, does that seem to really be working? Is is that helping the situation? Well, it keeps peace in the house. I I wouldn't say it helps, but it keeps peace in the house. So, uh, help me here with what you think peace is. What what is peace? When you say it's peace in the house. Well. There's not confrontation with neighbors. The house is quieter, you know, so I could rest more. You know, I, I usually kick them off to another room so I don't have to deal with that stuff. Okay, so what you're saying is it's just, you know, you, you feel better about the neighbors. You're not so, you know, tied up with the neighbors. I get embarrassed. And, yeah, you're not dealing with the embarrassment. Mm -hmm. And it's important that... Uh, for you to feel like you can just kind of rest in the house and so you kind of put him off in another room and let him do his thing and then you're sure. okay to do yours. Yeah. And you call that peace. More peaceful than letting him go <laughs> completely. Mm -hmm. So what would you do? What would you say at this point? Ouch! Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you you know? Do you feel like you're you're getting anything out of this? That you're giving up part of yourself when you uh, do this? Well, I do, I do. I guess yes. And then okay, she said yes. Then what do we follow up with? What's something to follow up with? Uh, is that really what you want? Is just to get the leftover stuff? No, I guess not. I'd rather have it, you know, differently, yeah. Andre, here we go. There it is. I want it differently. What she's saying. What is it you really do want? Well, I want him to get sober, to take responsibility. Well, listen, now it's me. <laughs> I want him to get sober. I want him to take responsibility for his life. And I guess no other way to put it, man up. Okay. So... What do we say? What would we say? What could we say? Okay, so yes. just reflecting. That's what you want. Yeah, that was very good, Bill. Yes. Okay, yeah. so she feels heard. Nice. Okay, now what? Well, I go to work. I pay the bills. I take care of responsibility. That's how I feel good. Yeah. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you said that what you really want is for your husband to get sober. Do you, do you think that what you're doing right now is helping, that it's helping you or helping him to reach that goal? Ah, he's making me reflect. Mm -hmm. No, I gotta say no. No. Now she's good. I'm gonna put a little parentheses in here. She's really good at one word, two word, three word answers, isn't it? It's hard to draw her out. Now, why do you think that might be? Being protective of not only herself in this relationship, but if she changes it, what's gonna happen? She's not going to feel safe anymore. She's got it all under wraps. She's I can getting... lose the relationship. <laughs> yeah. And she can, you know, have control over all this. This is fine, but as soon as I make a change and I put pressure on him, 
Then what's going to happen when you put pressure on him to get the man up here? What's happened in the past when you've tried it? He's probably going to get angry. Okay. And what do you do about when he gets angry? What do you do with that? I don't accept it well. You know, mm -hmm. he pushes, I push back. Mm -hmm. Any other questions you might want to ask at this point? I, I guess I had a hard time following what you're saying. It was a bit long. <laughs> it was great what you said. <laughs> if it's more than two words, we don't get it over 50. I'm sorry. <laughs> you So what do I feel like God would want me to do in this situation? Is that what you're saying? Okay. Yes, I, I think God would want me to take a stand, even if it meant me being alone and to be dependent on God to take care of me and my emotions instead of me dependent on me all the time. That sounds like some pretty good insight there. Have you felt like this for a while? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you struggle with it a lot, don't you? Sure. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay. So you see, it really is, it's a, it's a, it's a, you have to be aware of what God is working in you to work and talk with somebody who's struggling like that. We don't want to take, you know, I, we don't want to ram her with, well, you should be, you know, you should never let him do this. And, oh, he, he gets angry, just throw the bum out, you know. We can't do that. We have to be sensitive to her needs and what it is she's going through. And could we label some of her behaviors as codependent? Well, maybe yes, but we can't go, well, you are a codependent. You should read this book, you know? No. It's helping a person to see, well, you know, this is, this is keeping the peace, but is this really godly is this really you know john brought it very nicely some of the rest of you matt and some of you really brought this really good to help her to think about well, what does god want in this so um i don't have anything specific for you guys to work on this evening but i do think it would be nice if you got into groups of three or four or five whatever and talk about some of this where you see this these codependent type behaviors and where it is that you can intervene and how you can help uh, someone with these, with these behaviors, okay? So it's a quarter to nine. If you want to go, you can go. But if you'd like to stay and do a little discussing, uh, that would be great too. So I love you all. And I'm very thankful for your coming and being a part of this. You've been so faithful. Next week is our last week. We, <laughs> we went through this like three ways to Sunday. But next week is our last week. And uh, so please do come again, and we'll celebrate. Okay? God bless.